a light in the window A table spread in splendor Someone standing by the open door I can see the crystal river Lord, I must be near forever Come 
this opportunity again that tonight on this Wednesday night to uh, to spend a few minutes in worship grateful for Randy's leadership in music and then to spend a few minutes in prayer and digging into God's word and to be encouraged in that regard before we dig into the text tonight um, I just want to say a couple of real quick words and then as we anticipate uh, Sunday coming up what that would look like I want to say first of all thank you to Mark Moose who's been so valuable to us through these last two months who have just come alongside of us and have done a tremendous job in terms of the in terms of the production of the content for Sunday morning and Sunday night grateful for Andy and Jordan uh, who have certainly helped me think through Andy who's helped us on the technical side of things as well grateful for so many people that have come alongside and helped us in these last two months I'm excited about that because phase one as you know in our re-entry plan has been to uh, to see small groups regathering our groups have done zoom meetings even our children and our students have been involved in zoom meetings and Marco Polo uh, communications and so forth we move toward uh, person to person meetings and our adult small groups have been meeting either on campus or in homes they've been creative meeting on Thursday nights or Saturday afternoon and so folks have been good ministry have been taking place and I'm great for that and those small groups are going to continue to figure out ways and times and places to meet because we're not able to do that yet on a Sunday morning here uh, however we're moving into phase two and in phase two, we're going to be able to worship together. We're going to be able to be in the new sanctuary. Uh, we're working diligently in these days to put some final touches on that particular facility. But because we're not yet out of the pandemic, because we're still in the pandemic, things are still going to look a little bit different. You're not going to be able just to walk in a new facility, uh, but we're going to have to have restrictions in terms of respecting social distancing and some other recommendations. And so we're only really able to put about 100 people in the new fellowship or rather the new sanctuary at a time. And so for right now, because we're still in the pandemic, we're going to still retain three Sunday morning worship times, one at 8 o'clock, one at 9.30, one at 11 o'clock. If you choose to come at the 8 o'clock service, as long as we're in the pandemic, we'll still do these three services. And, uh, and if you come to the 8 o'clock service, we're going to require you to wear a mask. Now, we do that in, in trying to help uh, give a, a, a greater level of comfort to those people in our congregation that are still leery. They might be an older folk. They might be someone whose health might be compromised. And so we're giving them a safe place to come and worship in the, in the prime sanctuary, in our brand new sanctuary. So we're trying to help that at 8 o'clock. At 9.30 and 11 o'clock, those, those are recommended. Masks are recommended, but they're not required. But we're going to certainly encourage people to observe social distancing 
distancing and all of that. Now, our worship services are going to look much different uh, or somewhat different, I should say. We'll still have worship, still have preaching and all of that, but we're, we're going to try to minimize uh, the things. We won't be passing an offering plate. We won't be having a time of fellowship where we shake a hand and hug a neck and some of those dynamics that have become so part of our weekly worship won't be a part of our worship, at least for this season uh, of our church history. Uh, but nonetheless, we're going to look forward to get together. Now, because we're only going to be able to put 100 people in at one time, we're asking everyone to RSVP. Now, we actually announced this last Wednesday, and so there have been a lot of folks who have already responded. And so we've already had folks who have, in fact, 9.30 is filled up this morning while I'm making the broadcast on a Tuesday morning. Um, all but one spot has been filled up for the 11 o'clock service, and there's still space, about 40 spaces left at the 8 o'clock service. Now, you might be watching this morning and say, man, I wish I could have had one of those later times. I'm not a morning person. We recognize that there may be additional folks who, who want to come and be a part of this first service at Coral Hill on the 14th. And so we're actually adding a fourth service at 1230 and uh, on, on, this, on this coming Sunday. And so if, if you don't want to get up early and make it at that eight o'clock service, that's the only space we have left. And, and you say, I really want to be at church that day, then we're making a 1230 service available for you. Now, the way that you RSVP, uh, you can go right on our website, coralhillbaptist.com forward slash be the church. And there's a, there's a way that you can click some links that'll take you to um, a registration page where, whereby you can identify how many of you and your family plan to be here and what location you plan to attend. Now, the reason I said location is because we are providing overflow space. In our current sanctuary, we are providing live stream in that sanctuary to where folks who may want to come in at a regular time, uh, but that space is going to be even more dedicated. We are going to ask folks to wear a mask. We are going to check your temperature as you come in to that dedicated space just to make it as safe as possible, but that'll be live stream. So it's a little bit different from, uh, from our live service that's going to be in our main sanctuary. So a lot of stuff happening this week and be patient with us. We're looking forward to what God is going to do in these days and, and excited about that. Now, let me mention one other thing in terms of announcement before we get into our teaching time. And that is uh, we have been, we've been thinking through what Wednesday nights would look like. And now that we're able to get back into our facility, we're going to resume our Wednesday meetings uh, on, on campus. Now, we'll still live stream. We'll still make that content available uh, through this medium. Uh, but as far as, as far as being able to have this intimacy of me being in your living room uh, at this close juncture, uh, that'll, that'll look different, of course. But we'll be using our Wednesday night formats. We'll be teaching in the main sanctuary. Our students will begin to resume meeting, uh, I believe, on the 17th, on the Wednesday. They'll begin meeting in the fellowship, excuse me, in the sanctuary, our old sanctuary, and they'll be observing the social distance and so forth there as well. And so uh, we're slowly moving back into a full functioning fellowship and, and hopefully not simply going to back to what we were doing, but doing much more than we've ever done. And God has been so gracious in these days to help us think through these things. And he's brought so many good people around me who've helped me think through this, and I'm grateful for that. And, uh, and yet, in the midst of all of this, uh, we still have needs, right? People are still sick. People still have to say goodbye to loved ones who pass away. People are still facing surgeries. People still are struggling with the everyday cares of life. And so it's important that we would come together and pray for each other in these days. I want to take a minute. I want to pray. I ask the Lord's help this, uh, this evening as we return and finish up our study. And uh, pray that God will help us today. Join me. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful that in the midst of these days that you have given us a great grace, uh, that Father, back on March 15th, when we began to close out the church for a season, um, we didn't expect it to be this long. And even Father, when we begin to re-enter on the 14th, uh, we don't really know what that'll look like. We know that it's not going to be what it was. And uh, my prayer, Lord, is that what makes worship real, what makes it sweet, is not really the number of people in the facility, but it's the presence of Almighty God. Lord, I pray that you'll be pleased. I pray that you'll, you'll be, you, you will manifest your presence in such a way, not only this Sunday, but every time that we gather together, 
that Lord, we are not we are not excited about a building, but we are excited about the Spirit of God. We're excited about lost people coming to faith in Christ and about saints being encouraged and strengthened and emboldened in their walk with you. And so Lord, I pray that even in this teaching time tonight, in these few minutes that we have, uh, that you'll use this time to encourage your people to teach us and to draw us closer to you. Thank you for being our God, our Savior, our Lord, and our friend. For I pray this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, this evening, I want us to return to, uh, to a study that we began about, uh, about three weeks ago on the theology of gathering. And in this case, it's the theology of regathering. And um, we talked about a couple of weeks ago that uh, the Bible teaches us that certainly worship is private and personal, but we also understood that worship is public and corporate. Uh, God certainly wants me to worship him quietly and privately within my heart and within my home. But God never designed for worship to just stay there, but God's, God's intention was for me to gather with other brothers and sisters in Christ and to worship them together. And we took time to see that, that biblical dynamic that's played out in scripture. I, I recognize that in our culture today, there's a great emphasis that, that a person's faith is deeply personal. And that's true, but listen, if it's a genuine faith, it's, it's like the song we learned as children, hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. The reality is if it is who you are, it is who you are in public as well. And uh, while my time with Linda uh, may be quiet and personal and I share things with her privately that I would never share with anyone else, uh, my relationship with her publicly is not devoid of obvious uh, evidence that she and I are in a relationship together. So I'll hold her hand or I'll kiss her on the cheek or I'll stand next to her as a clear indication that, I, that she's mine and that I am hers. And so in a very real sense, yes, your time with God is deeply intimate and deeply personal, but, but it ought to be public as well, right? It ought to be public. It ought to be on display. And so there are times where God invites us to gather together as those that have been redeemed through the blood of the Lamb. We talked about also um, why God would have us come together. We talked about uh, that when we come together, what can we do together that I can't do by myself? Number one, we talked about that you, that you can't fulfill the command that the, that the Bible gives me in Hebrews 10, 25, that says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, uh, but, but, but exhort one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. God instructs us to gather together. But when we gather together, he says that our gathering is also um, an opportunity for us to be edified, for us to be strengthened and encouraged. When you're at home by yourself or maybe with a handful of your family members, nobody in that, in that room possesses all the spiritual gifts. But God in his wisdom has invested into the fellowship, into the body of believers, a gift or two that his design and desire is for those folks to express their spiritual gifts so that the entire body would be blessed and the entire body would be built up in the faith. I shared with you a week or so ago that a person can certainly go to heaven without going to church, uh, but, uh, but you can never be the Christian that you ought to be and that God wants you to be apart from the church. D.L. Moody often would say that if a man's religion can't get him to church on Sunday, why would he think that it could get him to heaven when it comes time for him to die? And so I would encourage you to understand that God is calling us to come together. We utilize our individual gifts for the benefit and blessing of the other brothers and sisters in Christ. When we gather together, the God's wisdom is, is that the church should be a reflection of the community. It should be a reflection of the kingdom of heaven. When you see the church, you see a collection of people that are different from each other as night and day. Their difference in likes and dislikes and preferences, differences in, in, in vocations, differences in, in opinions. And what God does in his wisdom is he takes this cornucopia of people and he brings them together in one body with only one head, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he forges us together as one individual who have one heart and one mind that the glory of God might be accomplished in us and through us. And so what we're doing is when we gather together, we're a reflection for our community and we're a reflection of what heaven will be because heaven's not going to be segregated. It won't have different specific groups in different locations, but we who have been washed in the blood of the lamb will find ourselves assembled before the throne of grace and before the God of glory. So last week, Jordan and I then finished up the third part of our series and we talked primarily 
necessarily about church covenant because church is not just about me and what I can get out of it, but to be a part of a church body means we enter into covenant with one another. You remember that last week, if you listened to the teaching, that, that a contract is based on law, legalism. And we sign that if you do your part, I'll do my part. And if either one of us fail, then the contract is null and void. But a covenant isn't like that. A covenant is not based on law. A covenant is based on love, which says that whether you do your part or not, I'm going to keep loving you. I'm going to keep being faithful to you. I'm going to keep serving you. And so when we enter into covenant in a church, we, we do a church covenant. Uh, when we enter into covenant, it means we're going to care for each other. We're going to pray for each other. We're going to encourage one another. There may be times where we need to chastise or rebuke each other, but that's for the glory of God that we might be strengthened in our journey. So what I'm trying to help you understand is that when we're talking about church, we're not talking about something that you sing three songs and hear a sermon and then go home and say, we went to church today. When I study, Ecclesi when I study Ecclesia or when I study the doctrine of the church, I discover that the church is much more than what we do here on a particular Sunday morning. So I want to finish up my teaching today. I hope that you are convinced, not because of a preacher's desire for you to be at church, but I hope you're convinced biblically that it's in God's will and in God's wisdom that we should gather together as God's family. So the question I want to address first for a couple of minutes today is what do we do when we gather together? I know God commands us to come together. I see the biblical wisdom and when, when, why I need to gather together. I, I understand that there's a covenant that binds me not only to God, but there's a covenant that binds me to you and you to me where we watch out for each other and strengthen each other in the journey. But when we gather together for, for, for what we call church, what are we supposed to do? So that's really where I am in my study tonight, and I'm not going to be very long this evening, but there are six basic things that I'm studying scripture uh, that are really helping me understand the teaching time tonight concerning what do we do when we gather together as a family of faith. Well, I, I want to remind you here that worship involves active participation and not merely passive observation. Now, I like that opening statement for me. Because for a lot of folks, church is just, I'm going to sit and stare at the service and see what's going on. Uh, but that's never been God's design. God's design is not for me to be an observer, but a participant in worship. So when we're talking about gathering together, we're not talking about sitting and staring, but we're talking about, about being active in the service. So what do we do? This thing of gathering together and being active, I, I came across a quote that I thought was phenomenal. Justin Martyr, who lived uh, in the second century in 165 AD, he makes this observation concerning gathering together because we get our cue from worship on how do we worship, watch this, we're to get our cue from what scripture says. We can see through 2,000 years of history what has been the pattern in church. Now certainly it's different. The expressions have been different in terms of music and, and, and scripture and all of that stuff. Those things are different expressions of different congregations. But when I look at what we do in church, particularly on a Sunday morning when we gather together to worship, what do we do? Justin Martyr in 165 AD said this. He said, on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in, or in the country gather together to one place and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets, that's the Old and New Testaments, are read as long as time permits. Then when the reader has ceased, the president verbally instructs and exhorts the imitation of these good things. Man, I, I love that. I love to understand that the very first thing I see that the early church did is that often they learned to read the scriptures together. They read scripture together. 1 Timothy 4.13 says, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. 1 Thessalonians 5.27 Paul writes, I command you in the name of the Lord to read this letter to all the brothers and sisters. In Revelation 1.3, John says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. I simply give you a number of verses to remind us that one of the things we do in church when we're gathering together is we take time to open God's word. It's no incident, it's no secondary issue to me that uh, 
often when you come into the church, you'll, you'll see our communion table, and on the communion table is a Bible, and that Bible is an open Bible. It's important to me that when I come to the pulpit that I open my Bible. What's being communicated is that we are a church that is centered on the truths of God's word. We want to communicate that not only visibly, we want to communicate that verbally. What sustains us is the truth. Listen, it's the truth of God's word. It's the truth of those doctrines that have been that have been taught out of God's word. And so one of the things that the church, one of the primary things a church will always do is make sure that the scriptures are primary within its fellowship. You ought to be careful if you go into a church and and the and and there's a singular reference to a, a Bible verse, but the pastor or preacher will speak more about what's on his heart or what's on his mind. Those things things may have their place at times, but the reality is, is that what we need is a thus saith the Lord. What we need to know is what's on God's heart, what's on God's mind, because his truth never changes. His truth is what we need and what we build our life upon. And so the church has been sustained and strengthened because it's his church, and those churches that often are the most healthy and that have the greatest longevity are those who are built on the truth of God's word. Listen, that's not only true for a church, that's true for your family. That's true for your personal life. Remember, Jesus would give the illustration in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7 of the book of Matthew about the two men that built their house, one on sand and one on rock. And when the storms came, the house built on sand was destroyed, but the house built on the rocks remained firm. There's going to be storms that come into our lives, into our family, into our church, storms that catch us off guard. But the reason we're going to make it, the reason we're going to be sustained, Sustained is not because we're wise and we're good and we're wonderful. A lot of times we're not any of that. But the reason we're going to be okay is because we're looking to the truth of God's word. We're relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. What I'm trying to help you understand is that God has said one of the things that keeps us bound together is that there was the consistent reading of God's word together. And not just the reading of God's word, but the studying of God's word. That's my second point. We not only read together, but we study together. We're just not sitting and listening to what's being taught, but there's someone who's providing instruction. I like this. It's, it's emphasized in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, where the Bible says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. I love that because it's really coupled with hearing the word of God where someone is proclaiming and preaching, but also teaching God's word, where we're studying God's word. We're discussing spiritual principles and spiritual truths and helping to uh, have iron, sharpen iron, right? And we're trying to encourage each other. Again, one of the early church fathers, in fact, a church historian by the name of Tertullian, uh, he was a Christian theologian of the second century. He, he talked about worship this way. He said, we meet together in order to read the sacred text. With the holy words, we feed our faith and arouse our hope. We confirm our confidence. I think that's great. He also says this about, uh, about the public reading of scripture. He says, the church unites the law and the prophets in one volume with the writings of the evangelists and apostles from which she drinks in her faith. You know what the early church fathers understood and what, when what the church, the, the, the strong churches, healthy churches have understood throughout the history of the church, 2,000 years, that the bedrock of our fellowship is the truth of God's word. It is not culture, it is not public opinion, it's not personal opinion. It is what God says in his word that ought to drive our church, that ought to drive your family, and that ought to drive your life. When the word of God is central, when the word of God is central, that is what gives you the anchor for your soul in the midst of an uncertain storm. And so God in his wisdom says, when you come together at the centerpiece of your worship needs to be the teaching and the preaching of the word of God. I make no apology for this. Listen, I appreciate music. I love music. I love to sing. I love to sing loud. I love to sing a lot. I think it's one thing we do. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And I appreciate the gifts of the arts and the drama and the, and the, and the pantomime and all things that we can use that express our faith. I appreciate all of that. 
But God has ordained that by the foolishness of preaching, by the teaching of God's word, that God's people would, would be edified and strengthened and tied together. Listen, listen, for a church that's conservative in her theology that believes in the authority of scripture, when there's a disagreement among brothers and sisters that are an honest disagreement, we can often go to God's word and find out what does God say about it. And what God says about it settles it. This is the anchor and what ties our faith to one another. And so when the church gathers together, we gather to read scripture. We gather together to study the word of God. And so I, I'm, I'm, I know this folks often say that uh, you, you preachers, you go along sometimes, and we do. But I'm going to tell you one reason I go along sometimes. And it's not because I love to hear myself talk. It's not that at all. I go along sometimes because I recognize that what people need is the truth of God's word. The Bible says you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. The Bible will tell us my people perish for lack of knowledge. You can often mark it down that when someone's life is falling apart, D.L. Moody would say this, that a Bible that is falling apart belongs to someone who's usually whose life is not falling apart. You can almost mark it down that when I begin to, 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 to walk in the flesh and to get away from God, it's because I, first of all, got away from his word. And can I tell you, that's not only true for me as an individual, but it's also true for our church. That if we'll make sure that God's word is open before us and we read it and we preach it and we teach it and we study it, this right here is what we need. Man, I'm, I know that for my soul. Have you, ever seen, have you ever seen a flower that's been without water for a while and it just begins to wilt? Isn't it amazing that if you add some water to that, uh, to the vase or you water it in the ground, how quickly that, that, that plant will begin to once again have vi vitality to it and beauty to it. And that's the same thing for the soul of a church that uh, when, when people are preaching politics, listen, I don't know about you, but when I'm watching Facebook or some other social media and all I'm hearing are these rantings and ravings, that doesn't encourage me and build my faith. It discourages me. I don't know of one argument that I have been persuade on, persuaded on because I read it on Facebook. But I can tell you this, what I've read in the Word of God has persuaded me. What I've read in the Word of God has changed me. What I have read in the Word of God has encouraged me, and it's built my faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I'm getting off my text points here just a little bit because I don't want, I don't want you to think for one moment that if we, if we, that the Bible is just a part of what we do. It's at the center. Christ is revealed through the blessed Word that He gives unto us. And so I want to be able to hold on to God's Word and have His Word hid in my heart. I heard a story years ago about a, a shipwreck out in sea, and they tried to rescue everybody that they could, but there was one boy, 17-year-old cabin boy, that was unaccounted for. They couldn't find him. Finally, when light finally began to rise up on the horizon, there was a rock jutted way out in the harbor, and they happened to find the young man hanging on to that rock all night. And they got him. He was shivering, and he brought him in, and they asked him the question, young man, uh, were, were you afraid, and were, were you shivering all night? And the young man said, oh yeah, I was shivering all night, and, uh, but, uh, but the rock that I was holding on to, it wasn't shivering at all. And can I tell you that's where our hope is? Amen. Can I tell you that uh, we may shiver and shake during these days of the pandemic and the riots and the news that we're hearing all the time. It makes us shake and it shakes our faith. But heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. You want to build your life. We want to build God's church on the principles and the truths of what he's revealed in his word. I'm spending way too much time on these two points, and I know that, and I'm going to move quickly through these other points, but I want you to see that this book, the truth of God's inerrant, infallible word, is what our church, what our families, and what our communities, and what our lives need to be built on. This is the solid rock. His name is Jesus Christ, who is revealed to the marvelous pages of God's inspired word. Man, I like that. I like to preach about it. I like to talk about that. So what do we do when we come together? 
we spend a lot of time in the word. We spend a lot of time, and I can't get away from this yet. We spend a lot of time in our small groups, helping our small groups know the value of prayer and fellowship. But what causes them to be strong small groups is that the word of God is being proclaimed. We make no apology for Wednesday nights and our ministry to our kids. We want our kids to memorize scripture. We want them to know the Bible from, from Genesis through, through Revelation. And so we bring them the gospel project. We're at the center of their curriculum is the teachings of the word of God. And so I, I, that's what we want to do. We want to pour the word of God. Andy, I appreciate him so much because while he gives time for fellowship and fun for our students on Wednesday night, Andy's a teacher of God's word. And he'll understand the value of moving our students toward uh, an appetite for the things of God. Listen, there's some things that you've got to develop an appetite for, right? And if you're, if, you're, if you're sampling from the chocolate box of the world, man, that's what you're going to be drawn to. And I appreciate Andy, and I appreciate those who understand the value of instilling in our children, in our students, God's church, uh, the truths of God's word, because that's what will sustain you. Let me move through these others very quickly. You know most of these, and so I don't want to hang out in any of these any much longer. But notice that when the church gathers together, we gather together, um, we gather together to, to read God's word. We gather together to study God's word. We gather together, when we come together, we sing together. Man, singing is a part of who we are. It's an expression of our faith. Singing is an expression of a happy heart. And I love what Ephesians 5.19 tells me. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody uh, in, with your heart to the Lord. We may not sing well, uh, but we ought to sing to the glory of God. I remember a story years ago, C.S. Lewis, uh, the British, uh, brilliant British philosopher who came to faith in Christ and has helped, helped the Christian church immensely through his writings. He, he talked about going to church one day after he had given his life to Christ. And he was standing next to an old boy, an old man who was in bib overalls and had boots uh, up, to his, up to his thighs or up to his calves. And he could hear him sing off key. And he thought that the songs that were being sung, he said, the words that he said, he said they were third-rate third rate songs written to fourth rate l lyrics. And uh, he, he thought the songs just didn't sound well, but he said he couldn't get away from the fact that the man standing next to him in those bib overalls, in those boots, in that dirty, dirty, rough looking character was singing to the top of his lungs to the glory of God. And he was persuaded by that. Can I tell you that God is not waiting for me to sing on key, but he is waiting for me to sing. He's not waiting me, and there's a reason that I can't sing alto and, and tenor and soprano and bass all at the same time. But isn't it a wonderful thing that the most powerful instrument in the world is the human voice, and God has given a voice to all of us? that we gather together and we can begin to sing our parts or at least sing what we know. And God begins to take this, this symphony of voices that have different, different abilities, different ranges, and he brings them together under one roof to the glory of God. And man, what a sweet sound it is. One of the best songs that you guys sing when we're singing in the church is, It Is Well With My Soul. When you're singing that and you're singing that with your heart to the Lord, man, I'll tell you what, there is no greater song that the church sings than that beautiful song by William Cowper. Uh, there, here's a fourth thing that the church does. We not only uh, read together, study together, sing together, we pray together. Man, how valuable is that? Jesus said in Matthew 21, 13, my house will be called a house of prayer. Man, that's what we do. I'm glad for people who are praying for me. I'm glad to know when people come to pray at an altar, we can surround them in prayer and to encourage them. I'm glad that we can do that. I'm glad that when there's a need that arises in the fellowship, we are able to pray for each other. One of the things we've not been able to do through this medium, um, because so many people are watching us online, we're very cautious about sharing people's personal health needs and struggles that they're going through. And we're cautious about that in the public arena anyway. But, but particularly during this, season when a lot more people are watching online but we but we're able to when we come together find a brother or sister that's been beaten or broken in life and just provide prayer for them we pray for the nations we pray for our community we pray for our leaders we pray for god's power and his anointing we are a people who sing we are a people who pray we are a people who gather around god's word and then we're a people who eat together 
Now, I'm not talking about fellowship and food and in the fellowship hall, but I am talking about people that observe the, 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 the church ordinances. We observe baptism and we observe the Lord's Supper. Uh, again, I, I read out of uh, a passage of scripture that says in 1 Corinthians 11, 26, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, a reference to the Lord's Supper, you are announcing the Lord's death until he come again. Man, baptism and the Lord's Supper are two things we do from time to time that announce not only the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but the promise of his soon and his sweet return. In fact, this Sunday morning at our 930 service, one reason that filled up so fast is that uh, Andy's going to be baptizing Matthew, and that'll be our first baptism, and it's going to be a great celebration, but we've got more folks to baptize, so everybody will be able to experience that. Baptism and eating together the Lord's Supper, it's what we do. It's who we are. We gather together to worship. We gather together to read God's word. We gather together to sing his praises. We gather together to, in, to, to observe the ordinances by, by eating the bread and drinking the juice and celebrating the conversion of a soul through the celebration of baptism. And then the final thing we do together, of course, is that we go on mission together. Because God's intention is for me not simply to gather together and to be a holy huddle, but at some point that huddle needs to break and we need to be salt and light in the community in which God has planted us and placed us. In fact, the companion passage is two places, Matthew 28, 19, where Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Paul would write in Acts 13, 1, 3, this is what Luke wrote rather, he said, now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barabbas, or Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. I like that. The church is a church that gathers together. Then together they're a church on mission. They're either going on mission themselves or they're commissioning individuals within that fellowship to carry the gospel beyond the borders and boundaries of their own fellowship. You see, that's why you can't worship the Lord at home by yourself. You can't commission yourself. You don't have those spiritual gifts that the rest of the body has. You can't be edified and encouraged by someone who's speaking specifically into your life, who knows you and knows, knows those things that are happening in your life. And I'm telling you that when we gather together, God's purpose and his plan is that we read and study God's word, that we sing, that we minister to each other, we pray with each other, and then, we, then, then once the amen is spoke, we go into the mission field to communicate and demonstrate the love of Christ to all the world. I close, I close with this uh, thought this evening. Someone said of many, uh, many believers that well, we got things turned around in our day concerning this called worship and play and, and work. We have, a, we have those things all mixed up. And they said it this way, we are a person who we worship our work, we work at our play, and we play at our worship. It's rather interesting, that statement, isn't it? We play at our worship, we work at our play, and we worship our work. We place work at as a high priority. I can't do that because I've got to go to work. And when it comes to working out, well, we really work hard to get our body in shape and so forth. But when it comes to worship, that kind of takes a secondary ladder. Now, I want to tell you this as I close the statement this morning on the theology, or this evening on the theology of gathering. And that is, uh, when I'm studying scripture, worship is not, is not third on the list. Worship's not second on the list. Worship is primary. It's first on the list. Have no other gods before me. God said, I, when, you, when you love me, I want you to love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. God has not called me to, 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 to worship at my convenience. Everything else ought to take a back seat. Everything else ought to be secondary. If God says what's primary in the life of a believer is that believers worship before the Lord, then that ought to be primary in my heart and life. In fact, when we gather this Sunday, uh, again, I'm going to be preaching, uh, suspending my teaching on Romans chapter 9. We're going to get there in a couple weeks. But as far as this Sunday coming up, we're going to be looking at Ezra chapter 3. 
And uh, we're going to talk about the value and the importance of worship and why that needs to be central, not only within the context of a fellowship, but why that needs to be important and primary in the context of your own heart and life. Listen, here's what I want to say. When Christ is in the center of your life, when Christ is in the center of your heart, man, how you're able to handle life so much better, right? You have the hope and the confidence and the strength. When Christ is in the center of his church, when he's where he ought to be as Lord and, and sovereign in the center of his church, man, that church can function the way that it ought to. I close this with this simple illustration. If you can imagine a wagon wheel, and in the middle of that wagon wheel is a hub, and let's suppose that hub was off center just a little bit, not much, but that hub was off center just a little bit. That would cause that wheel not to turn in a circular fashion, but in an oblong fashion, right? Because that, that the, the, the hub is not at the center. And everything on the wagon that that wheel, that, that wheel is under is jostled because the wheels are off center. And so here's what has to happen. We've got to move that, that hub back to the center of that wheel. And that wheel will then begin to turn circular in the way that it's supposed to. You know what God is trying to do? You know why God gives you church? To keep you spiritually centered. Did you know that? He's given you brothers. He's given you his word. He's given you his spirit. And he's, he's, he's transformed you. And when what church does is that church enables me to have to, to refocus my week. Maybe I've had an awful week. I've had a terrible week. And I come into the Lord's house and Jesus is exalted. Jesus is magnified. He's worshiped. He's adored. He's proclaimed. And it causes my soul to center itself once again in the word and in the will of God. And when I'm in the word and when I'm in the will of God, doesn't mean that I'm not going to have struggles and troubles and problems in life. But what it means is that he gives me peace in the midst of the storm. I know it's going to be all right because he is in the center of my life. I hope that you'll take advantage of church. I hope you won't make it secondary. I hope you, that you just don't say, well, if there's nothing else to do, I'll be there. I hope in your life that not only this Sunday, but every Sunday to come, every time you have opportunity that you'll make church a priority because it's more than just three songs and a sermon. It's the vital lifeline of your spiritual life. I thank God for you. I bless the Lord for you. And I'm so excited and looking forward to seeing you this coming Sunday. God bless you guys.